Martin Reeves, Chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute, and welcome to our series of conversations on beautiful business, where we're going to be trying to get at the human dimension of some of the common challenges and opportunities we face of humanity through the lens of seven questions. And to do that, I'm very pleased to be joined by Michaela Musilova, who is an astrobiologist um, who holds many uh, positions, but one of them is with the University of Hawaii, where you're the head of uh, analog uh, astronomy, is that right? Virtual missions to, to Mars and the moon and, uh, and, and other places. Um, so from this very uh, galactic perspective, we'll be discussing these, these questions today. So thanks for joining us. Ah, thank you very much for the introduction. Happy to be here with you today. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm the director of the High Seas Facility, which is where we organize simulated missions to the Moon and Mars, and it is under the International Moon Base Alliance, so uh, a very international entity working with universities around the world, but also different companies, space agencies, and independent organizations. So my first question is, um, we're at this rather unusual conference, the the house of beautiful business. Um, so what brings you here? I'm guessing you're here for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, well, uh, the main reason is that I've been invited to speak at this event. Uh, I'll be speaking later today uh, about how we're preparing to live on other planets, uh, but also what that means for us as humanity here on Earth. So not just targeting living somewhere else, but actually how we can make use of the technologies and the knowledge that we develop by training to live on other planets here on Earth to make our life here better. And that is one of the reasons I'm here uh, also is because I, I like being in different environments to the ones I usually spend time in as a scientist. So I want to, uh, you know, gain new perspectives, learn new things from people that think differently that are around me, uh, here uh, at this conference. Um, India, if I understand correctly, you're an expert on extreme environments as an astrobiologist. Um, so we may have one of those um, here on Earth soon, uh, according to one view. Um, so um, I observe that um, we're now finally, I think, uh, very engaged on the problem of, of, of climate change. It's, uh, it's in, the, in the popular consciousness. Uh, but if I look at the temperature line, and if I look at the, the emissions line, I, I can't see any inflection for all of our efforts so far. Um, so, as an extreme environment astrobiologist, what, what's missing from the picture? What would it take to change the line that's, that's currently missing? I, I think, you know, while the public or a lot of the public is aware of this crisis we're in and um, a lot of the problems that are going to be linked to it in the future and are currently existing, I think people don't understand just how important it is how immediate it is that it's it's right now it's happening and how you know perhaps yes some communities are going to be less affected than others but some communities around the world are already suffering right now so i think there's not enough awareness about the severity of the situation and i think a couple of days ago there was a letter written by greta thunberg and i think vanessa nakate to the media pointing out several of these things that people just are not aware of and the media really needs to help convey that message and one of them is time that actually this is a pressing issue and if you don't literally do things right now we're going to be in a lot of trouble in only a few years so i think you know while there is some awareness about climate change we're just not actively enough doing or trying to make changes now so suspending all notions of practicality and ignoring constraints if you with you know godlike properties could modify one ingredient to the current situation to put us to put us on track what would be that missing ingredient that you'd add back uh, i think it always comes down to us humans you know even if we somehow magically solve this problem right now we would probably end up causing some other problem because we many times just focus on our own issues and our own futures don't think about the collective so what i would like to do is just raise this awareness, try and make sure this message literally re reaches every person on the planet and that we decide to work together for once and not in just some areas, but literally in this issue that affects us all and our children and grandchildren and, and so on. So what I would love to do is be able to just reach everyone, send this message and you know, find some agreement so that we can all have a better future together. When we were chatting beforehand, you said that you were a realistic optimist. Are you slightly optimistic or do you have qualified optimism on the topic of climate change too? 
So, I mean, of course, there's a, a lot of negative stuff out there, especially since we're not progressing as fast as we should be with making changes to an, our environment and to our policies and business and so on to reduce the negative effects we as humans are leaving on this planet. The reason I remain an optimist is because wherever I travel around the world, I meet wonderful people that selflessly help others. There's just so much good in humanity that we sometimes forget about that because we let ourselves be drowned by the negative news around us. So that's what keeps me an optimist is that there's a lot of good out there and I think we just need to focus on that and work together and you know, help each other in this selfless way because it's, it's in all of us. We just sometimes put it to one side for various needs and reasons. Um, and that's what keeps me optimistic is I think if we all kind of you know, look into ourselves and, and try and work with others, we can make big changes. It's just a matter of wanting to do that. So thinking about the contribution of, um, of business, which um, is probably part of the problem and part of the solution. So Tim Lebrecht, the, the founder of The House of Beautiful Business, um, has this idea of beautiful business, not just um, socially responsible business, but beautiful business. Do you think businesses or institutions in general can be beautiful? And what would that mean to you? I guess it depends on each person's individual definition of beauty. Um, for me personally, if I were to try and see what, what, a, what could be beautiful about a business, I think it comes back to the people again. Uh, you know, what, how do they work together? How do they uh, work with the community that they're in? That's, you know, many times I think the most important, for me, important thing for me when I think of a business is, okay, yes, they're developing new technology or whatever it is they're doing, but how are they contributing to the community, not only around them, but worldwide? Are they a selfish entity or are they genuinely trying to make society better? And that's where I see beauty is when I see how they're, for example, working uh, with volunteering groups or they have a lot of young people doing internships or they somehow uh, contribute to helping the environment or whatever it is. That, for me personally, is beautiful. And so that's how I see beauty in a business. But I'm sure everyone you know, interprets it in different ways. So it's, it's hard to connect with very slow problems or very complex problems. And uh, you know, one way of connecting with the long term is to think about the next generation of people that we actually know. So I believe that you're involved in a lot of educational outreach, a lot of work with young people. Um, what would you wish for the world of that next generation for, for people that, that you actually know? And what would you hope that they see about your contribution to bringing that about? Well, first of all, I really hope that they will have a future, <laughs> that they will have a planet that they can live in, an environment and um, politicians that listen to their needs and actually work with them. Uh, there is a crisis happening right now, and it is, thank goodness, there are a lot of young people who are fighting for this, but I feel like they're still not being heard. And so I really wish for them to be heard and to be able to have the same kind of lives that many of us uh, have the fortune of having or the privilege. Um, so that's my main wish to them. And uh, as a leader, I've been working to be an empathetic one, uh, a person that empowers my community through my leadership. So for example, I've now run over 30 simulated missions to the moon and Mars as a commander. And instead of being, you know, kind of your classical military type commander, you may imagine from sci-fi movies, I like to be more like a, like a mother of a, of a group of people where we're there on the moon and Mars as a family rather than just a group of professionals trying to work together. And in this way, I hope to empower everyone to really um, raise concerns if they have any, to communicate how they feel, what they want, what they need. And usually at the end of every mission, we come out as a space family rather than just, again, a group of scientists. And in this way, I'm hoping to show young people in the next generations that you can be a leader in this kind of way where you can be equal with the others. You don't have to be all powerful and commanding and you know, of a certain race and gender and things like that. And that's why it's also very important to have very diverse groups. I specifically select my crews to be diverse, not only uh, in terms of their expertise, scientists. I also have artists and engineers, but I also have people from around the world of all faiths and cultures. And I found that those were the best working groups because every person brings a very different perspective to the group and we can learn so much from one another. So I had a very interesting nuance in the first part of your answer there, which is, um, so we typically think about our responsibility for the next generation, but I, I heard you say, you know, listen to them. So I guess one model is, 
you know, if they have the biggest stake in the future, you know, listen and uh, allow them to take up the stewardship responsibility. Like, you know, I guess it's a question of who is the leader here. Is it us or them or us with them? Well, I think that's uh, it's, a, it's a great point you raise, and that's part of this empowerment leadership. It's, you know, you, as a leader, you should be listening to the people you're trying to lead. And, you know, the leaders in many parts of the world that are currently in power are not listening to these young people who are saying, our futures are in danger because of what you're doing right now and your predecessors have been doing for centuries. Uh, listen to us. And so it needs to be a dialogue so both parties not only feel heard, but we can actually work together to make these changes that will ultimately affect the next generations. So one of the, um, another complexity of the, the challenge we have is, is that, um, I mean, in business, we, we usually break a problem down into its parts and solve the parts. And assume that if we solve the parts, we've solved the whole. But this is very interactive, a very systemic problem. Um, if I, as a car manufacturer, decide to make my cars of aluminium, they may consume less fuel, but on the other hand, it may create uh, more um, emissions uh, in, the, in, the, in the production of a, of a more energy-intensive metal. Um, so how do, we, how do we get to a collective solution as opposed to a solution to the parts of the, of the problem? Because we don't have a global government to say, here is a total solution. It's a, yeah, it's a tricky question uh, and, and something I'm sure a lot of people are working on to solve. Uh, I found that just having these kinds of dialogues is very important. You may have conferences, things like that, but many times these congresses and conferences, they talk about these things, but not many actions are taken afterwards. So it's really having a dialogue between different businesses and communities um, on a local scale and then a much bigger scale, but then actually sticking to the actions that you know everyone is pointing out, we need to do something about this, set realistic goals, and with climate change, send very pressing goals of getting these things done as soon as possible. Uh, and then working together. Again, I feel like many times just parties are not being heard. Things are being said but not done. So I think if we all just commit to do better, to stick to the things we say, and most importantly, communicate with others, not just in our local community, but realize how our actions here in Europe actually impact other countries around the world, who many of them are facing much more difficult situations than we are. So my, uh, my final question is um, a little bit of a strange question, but um, the House of Beautiful Business, it, it, it does have these interesting contradictions and juxtapositions, beauty and business and concreteness and, and love. And um, you know, I guess the language could be an important element here. That, that, you know, that which we don't say, we may not think and we may not do. So um, if you look at the words that we use in, uh, in business or, or the words that we use in relation to, uh, to climate change more generally, um, which is a word that you would wish us to be using more often and, and what would be the consequences of that? I think the word that has had the biggest impact for me and I believe could be very helpful to other people is empathy. It's just so important to try and understand what other people are going through, to see their point of view, to you know hold back before you react to something. And that's something I've been going through various types of leadership training. And it, it's something you know human in us where, for example, someone gives us negative feedback or, or it's criticizing us and we instantly want to react and be defensive. Instead, wait a moment, process, keep your emotions under control, and then try and see what they're trying to tell you, and then react, and in a controlled manner. And empathy is kind of all part of that. It really helps connect us. And actually, a few years ago, I was at a congress called uh, The Leaders of Tomorrow, and with a colleague, we talked about this beautiful metaphor of how, you know, in a future, if it, for example, gets dominated by robots, they may be building these high towers, but they're all going to be kind of separated. But it's empathy that's going to be that human connection that will, you know, go above these towers, go about, uh, above a drowning environment. And that's really what the most human in us is, is that empathy, that human connection. So I wish for that to be more present, not only in, you know, reports about businesses, but most importantly, in everyday actions and uh, empathetic leadership relationships and really having that communication, that dialogue, listening to each other and taking action. Well, thanks so much uh, for spending time with me today, Michaela, discussing this important question from some uh, unusual angles. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.